All right. Good morning, everyone. Um, another Wednesday morning in May, and uh, I think April showers have just brought May showers in addition to the May flowers this year. Um, um, but uh, I'm delighted for um, our grand rounds this morning and our speaker. I'm just giving folks a few seconds. That's why I'm stalling a bit to come in from the, um, the waiting room um, before we start announcements. All right. Uh, Roussel, can we bring up the slides? Um, and we'll get those started. Just a few announcements before um, I introduce our speaker. Our, our regular host and associate chair for communications, Dr. Azdalga, is out today, so um, I will be hosting this morning. Uh, I wanted to just remind folks of a couple different events that are happening this month. This is uh, May is Asian American and Pacific Islander Heritage Month, and so uh, I wanted to share that our Center for Asian Health Research and Education is hosting um, multiple events this month, um, including this panel um, on what does it mean to be Asian in America, featuring our, um, our own um, clinical professor in the Division of Primary Care and Population Health, Dr. Malafi uh, Srinivasan, as well as, as well as Dr. Russell Jung, who's the Director of Asian American Studies at San Francisco State University, uh, and excuse me, um, Neil Ruiz, who is um, part of the Pew Center um, and uh, is the Associate Director of Race and Ethnicity Research there, as well as Dr. Richard Pan, who's our former state senator and mm -hmm. a senior advisor to um, Stop AAPI Hate. That's May 16th um, at 12 to 1 p.m. Um, the next slide is uh, another panel that's happening this month. Um, it's a little more local to Stanford Medicine, um, multiple AAPI leaders here in our journeys, um, including myself, Tip Kim, who's our Chief Market Development Officer for Stanford Healthcare, and Do Huang, who is the Director of Perianesthesia, and Dr. Kekoa Tapara, who is a, a radiation oncology resident and physician scientist. Um, so that is May 15th. And registration links will be in the chat. Thank you so much, Winona. Uh, and um, the last event, oh, I actually, yes, is actually this happening today. This is a screening of a documentary um, in honor also of Mental Health Awareness Month um, on engaging Asian American youth and their families in quality mental health services featuring Debbie Lum, who is the producer of the documentary, Try Harder. Um, and Dr. Rona Hu, his, who is a clinical professor here of psychiatry, uh, and uh, excuse me, Kathy Zhao, who is the chief laughing officer um, at Laugh It Out Hub, and Kian Mojabi, who is a high school student who is featured in the documentary itself. Um, and there is both an in-person viewing as well as a virtual um, screening as well this evening. And I will pass it to Dr. Dunn for several other announcements before I introduce our speaker. Thank you, Dr. Harmon. Well, everyone, what do, what do Fong Kao, Keon Pearson, Natasha Steele, Leah Reichley, Maki Nakazato, Mai Sedki, Teresa Dunham, Diana Mello, Abu Bakar Mohammed, Pradeep Sidapa, Ravneet Bhatia, and Ian Lee? What do they all have in common? They are residents and fellows that are part of this cohort of the LEAD program, Leadership Education and Advancing Diversity. They have worked along with other residents and fellows across the GME for 10 months to put together a DEI focused workshop that will be presented as part of the Diversity and Inclusion Forum, which is happening this Friday, right in Berg Hall at Li Kaxing. It's an in-person um, event. And it's going to be this Friday, May 12th from 8 a.m. to 1 p.m. There will be a keynote address by former Stanford resident, Dr. Devika Bhushan. And that's sure to be an amazing presentation. And there will be workshops available for you to see and to learn from. The link is in the chat, or you can also um, scan the QR code that you see on your screen to register. We hope to see everyone out there on um, Friday, May 12th, 8 a.m. to 1 p.m. And lastly, I just want to remind everyone that um, we do have a diversity and inclusion listserv now. And if you want to be kept abreast of all of our events and our programming, please, please, 
email Winona Alba and her email is Winona at stanford.edu. And we will also put that in the chat. With that, I will hand it back over to Dr. Harmon. Thanks, Dr. Dunn. Um, so just a reminder for our Grand Rounds next week on May 17th, it will actually be both in person and on Zoom. So in person LKS 120 and Zoom. Uh, it will be Dr. Peter Hotez, who is Dean of the National School of Tropical Medicine, who will be joining us from Baylor. Um, he'll be speaking on global vaccinations and the anti-poverty vaccines, science versus anti-science. Please join us. Um, it, it's going to be a wonderful Grand Rounds. Uh, and with that, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker for this morning, Dr. Tan Neville. Um, Dr. Neville is an associate professor in the Division of Pulmonary and Critical Care Medicine at the UCLA uh, School of Medicine. She has been at UCLA uh, since medical school and has also completed her medicine residency there, as well as her pulmonary critical care fellowship and master's in health services there. Her research interests, um, very close to my heart uh, as a palliative care physician in ethics and palliative care in the intensive care unit. Um, it, part of her research actually has been um, in how, um, how best to communicate that communication matters in the ICU um, and is part of a, uh, a study that um, I quote often around framing care in the ICU in the context of time limited trials. Um, she is also um, the founder of the UCLA Three Wishes program, um, which began in 2017 and currently serves as the medical director. Uh, and so it is uh, my pleasure to welcome um, Dr. Tan Neville, um, who will be speaking on bringing compassion to the bedside, the UCLA Three Wishes program. Dr. Neville. Thank you so much. Let me just share my slides. You guys all see this? Yeah? Okay. Yes, we're good. Thank okay. you. So uh, thank you so much for having me. So my name is Tom Neville, like Stephanie Harmon said, this is, um, I'm an associate professor at UCLA. And today I will be talking to you about our Three Wishes program. So I kind of always start this presentation with this image. And what you see is this is a patient in the ICU. This is a patient who is connected to multiple modes of life support. There is a dialysis machine in the front. There's a ventilator in the back. And as you can see, this can be kind of a very dehumanizing um, situation. And it's very easy for healthcare workers like you and, and nurses and other physicians to kind of think of this more as a patient and solely as a patient and not as a person. So really our goal with the Three Wishes program is that our hope is to humanize this environment a little bit more. So the premise of our program is really simple. It's by bringing a set of wishes to fulfillment in the final hours or days of a patient's life. This will bring peace to patients and their families. And this is where a little bit, it gets a little bit confusing. And I always say, you know, wishes can be of anybody. So it can be of the patients, the family members, the ICU clinician, the three wishes team. So for instance, if the patient is comatose and has no family, and you as a doctor or you as a nurse want to bring a blanket or play their favorite music at the end of life, that is considered part of three wishes. And our goal is really to improve the end of life experience for patients and their families and to improve the grieving process. For patients, it's to dignify their death and celebrate their life. For families, to humanize the dying process and create positive memories. And for providers, it's really to foster patient and family-centered care. Um, I want to say that this is not a program that I started. This was a program that is started in St. Joseph's Healthcare in Ontario by a uh, researcher and physician by the name of Dr. Deborah Cook. She's actually a very renowned researcher in the field of intensive care. And what she does, did it was she initiated this project and basically only did it when she was on service, which was one week out of every four and published her findings in the Annals of Internal Medicine, and this is how I really found out about it. And what she found was that it created positive memories, it individualized and applied care, and it promoted interprofessional care and humanism. Um, so um, what happened was then that I then applied for a small seed grant from the Institute of Palliative Care. And this was a, uh, 
uh, a small grant by is amount of $10,000 to initiate small projects in uh, palliative care at the time. And I happened to be on service when our IRB finally got approved that day for us to initiate the program. Um, and I wanted to tell you a little bit about the story about the first three wishes patient. Uh, so I was the ICU attending and I was on service and I met this gentleman who unfortunately was dying, if not for weeks, days in the ICU. Um, he had a bone marrow transplant that went wrong and he had horrible disseminated HSV and was in status epilepticus um, constantly um, and maintained on multiple pressors and I could barely oxygenate him on 100% FR2 on the ventilator. Uh, this was extremely difficult for his wife. I mean, you can imagine this is a young couple. They just recently got married. They recently just moved to um, Santa Monica to have a new life. And one of the really important things for them was the outdoors. They loved hiking. They always went to take a walk around sunset time. And the thought of him dying within the four walls of the ICU was something that was terrifying to her. Um, and what we uh, suggested to her was that you know, perhaps that his last moment doesn't have to be within the four walls of the ICU and that we can take him out to this terrace that is connected to um, our hospital, that's part of our hospital, uh, mm -hmm. that is used as a break area for um, our psychiatric patients, actually, and do end of life care there. I think that, you know, a lot of people don't realize, but this is a big deal, right? So this area, as you can see, really is not meant for patient care. Um, we had to make sure the bed would go in through the door, that we had to make sure there's enough oxygen. Um, he came with a lot of IV poles and nurses and RTs and respiratory therapists accompanying me out there along with the family. Um, but what happened was we were able to achieve it. And as the sun began to set, his wife climbed into his bed with him and I gave her a blanket and she snuggled up with him and I disconnected him from the ventilator and he died peacefully in her arms. Um, as you can imagine, this was a very emotional event. A lot of us were obviously in tears, um, but what was more remarkable to me is what I learned from her, how much this meant to her. Um, I think that, you know, this the cost was amazingly low, right? I mean, this is the cost of our time, obviously, but then, this was the cost was the blanket that I had, the $20 blanket that I handed to her. And when I brought her back for an interview, I asked her, you know, Sandy, I don't know if you remember, but we um, gave you a blanket and we um, gave your family some keepsakes to take away with you on that day. Um, and this was her response. And please let me know if you can hear it, Ashley. I actually sleep with that blanket every night. Because <laughs> that was the last thing that he, like, touched and had on him so I thought it was very nice that you know they were able to give those little mementos out it's not something I was expecting in the least so I hope that means you guys didn't hear it yes thank you thank you okay <laughs> um so I wanted to go further and you know a little bit about the nitty-gritty of the program after I've given you that example so this program is really for our really critically ill patients. Um, these are the patients who are uh, not going to be leaving the hospital or leaving in a form of hospice. There is what we say, you know, 95% probability of dying during the ICU stay, or there's a decision made to withdraw or withhold advanced life support in anticipation of death. I wanna emphasize that this is not a uh, substitute for the goals of care discussion. This is not where uh, we tell about the, the families and a patient about the prognosis. This has already been done. The family has already been informed. Uh, the last thing I want is for the family or the patient to hear about an end of life care program without knowing that the patient is at the end of life. You know, we, we encourage a very conversational approach so we, I always say, you know, take this time to learn more about who this patient is before they became uh, critically ill and use that conversation to probe potential wishes. You know, I can say that I have multiple times come to the family and say, you know, I am so sorry that your mother, your father is so ill. We have a project in our ICU called Three Wishes, and the goal of the project is to help patients and families during this difficult time. How can we honor your mother, your father? 
And I can tell you more often than not, I am met with very blank stares because this is not a conversation that patients and families are used to having in the hospital. Um, so I say, you know, let's take a step back. Can you tell me a little bit more about who this person is? Um, tell me about your mom. What did she like to do before she come, she became sick? Does she have a favorite music, favorite pastime, favorite flowers? And it's really in these contexts that we're able to suggest new wishes. So for example, this is a patient who um, loved Lakers on the upper right and a patient who was a UCLA grad who is a very actually school spirited. And we learned that and decorated her room and encouraged the family to bring in pictures. Um, we learned quickly that actually patients and families really wanted some written material and some time to digest these questions. And uh, so we created a brochure that we, and it's not very, um, it's not uncommon that I now walk into a room uh, for a patient uh, with three wishes uh, introduction with the brochure in hand and I can leave the brochure with them and tell them, you know, this is this is what the program is about. Take your time and I check in on them later and say, you know, if there's anything they need. So the next few slides, I want to take a little bit of time to uh, show you pictures about the breath and all the wishes that we have achieved as part of our program, just to kind of give you a better idea of what these wishes are. I can say by far, um, keepsakes is our most common category of wishes. And um, to be very honest, I was very surprised at how meaningful these things are. As a person who's not super sentimental myself, uh, I learned quickly that these, it, these inanimate objects are very um, real and very tangible and important for families to hold on to as they walk away losing their loved ones. Um, so what you see in the lower right corner are fingerprint keychains, and I can tell you that we have made thousands and thousands of these that is really important for uh, families to be able to hold on to something that represents their loved one. And so many times I have talked to families afterwards and say, you know, I don't know, you remember, we gave you some keychains to walk away with, and they would pull it out of the purse and ask me, you know, the one that I carry with me every single day. Um, yes, you know, <laughs> and, you know, the other things that we have done is we've encouraged families to create their own keepsakes that they want. This was a volleyball coach and um, her and his grandchild was actually now playing volleyball and she wanted his handprint on the ball that he was going to, uh, uh, that she was going to serve at the next game. So they brought in the own, their own volleyballs and we were able to put his handprint on them for the family. These are uh, EKG strips, and I can tell you these, this EKG template down the bottom with the heart is something that became extremely valuable during the pandemic because these are keepsakes that can be created uh, that are personalized, meaningful, and yet it doesn't require for the patient to be there. It doesn't require for the family to be there. So as many of you guys experienced during the isolating times of the COVID pandemic, it was really nice to be able to create something that didn't require those things and could be mailed home. These are locks of hair. Um, this is a uh, sculpture with a, um, uh, a husband and wife holding hands for the final time. Um, as you can see, it's beautiful, it's stunning, and this is actually something that the nurses can do at the bedside with a kit that I buy from Amazon, and it's an all-in-one thing. And on the bottom is what you see is a blanket um, with a handprint. And what this represents is actually the young, uh, the patient was a young mom who was unfortunately dying and the nurses felt like it would be really important for her kids to go up knowing that, you know, she really wanted to be close to them, always wanted to hold them. And she made these personalized blankets by putting the mom's hand on this for the two uh, young kids who were, um, who I think, five and six year olds. On the upper right corner, what you see is a stuffed animal, but it's a little bit more special than that because this stuffed animal actually has uh, the heartbeat recording uh, of the patient. And we have been told that this is something that families would want. And we've worked out a system where we can record the patient's heartbeat and put it in a sound box for them. <clears throat> These are word clouds, and I always say, you know, word clouds, I think of them as keepsakes, but they are more than that in that um, they're really a great way to bring family and loved ones together. 
um, because it's more of an activity as well. You know, so oftentimes uh, for those of you who work in palliative care or, or in the ICU, once there has been a decision to withdraw life-sustaining support, it could be minutes, it could be hours, it could be days where the family is just grieving at the bedside. And what I say is that, you know, let's not focus on the dying process anymore, but you tell me, here's a blank piece of paper. Tell me about your loved one. Who is this person? This is a person who likes to fish. This is a person who likes to read. This is a person who has a great sense of humor and was known as the original gangster in the family or something like that. And I say, you know, put all these words on and we will create a word cloud for you that you can bring home. And so often I've heard that these are blown up as posters, displayed at memorials, or even passed on as gifts to the family members and put on t-shirts as a, as a, at family gatherings. And these are like of the wide breadth of that we have made. We've also made hundreds of these, and this is all created on a uh, free online um, wordart.com website. So this is something that could be easily done also with the patient, the family's not no longer there and we can mail it out. You know, humanizing the environment, right? Nobody really imagines that, you know, they will be spending their final moments in a hospital uh, surrounded by strangers. So we can, we strive to kind of make that environment a little bit more welcoming, a little bit more warm. This is the Lakers you saw earlier, but we also encourage family to say, you know, bring in whatever pictures you want, put it up like this. this we can certainly honor who the person is before they got sick. Um, on the upper, uh, this picture right here with the blanket and the hearts, this is actually kind of a ritual that our neural ICU does for our uh, patients who do not have family. So this is for patients who don't have anybody at the bedside and the nurses feel that it's necessary that they decorate the room, they hang these parts up, they give the patient a non-hospital blood bed, uh, sorry, non-hospital blanket, and they actually gather around and give them a moment of respect and silence. On the bottom, what you see is um, a gentleman who really wanted to um, be in nature and be camping with his young kids. Um, as you can see, that was not possible, but we certainly tried and we brought the moon and the stars in his room so that he could spend the time on hospice uh, with his grandchildren in there. On the upper right corner, what you see is a, a decorated room, Disneyland meet Star Wars style. And the story behind this one was a young gentleman um, who was in his 30s, but he had cerebral palsy, so it was very development to delay, probably more of the equivalent of a 10 year old. And what his mother told us was that she had promised him to take him to Disneyland um, on his coming birthday. And that really didn't look like it was going to happen. Uh, so we decorated the room with Star Wars um, and Disneyland uh, uh, decorations. <clears throat> Facility connections. Um, so not surprisingly, I think to many of you that uh, four-legged friends are really important to a lot of people. I will probably get fired one of the days for this, but um, I've we certainly have brought many puppies and kittens in uh, for family and patients, and they really, really mean so much to many people. Um, this upper right-hand corner is that same patient that I talked about with the Disneyland. So, um, so to be more specific, his wish was... Uh, that he loved Rihanna, he loved Disneyland, and he loved Yoda. Uh, we couldn't bring Rihanna, <laughs> but we were able to reach out to a company that actually volunteered Mickey and Minnie to come to the bedside, and they played Rihanna music, and they had a big party in his house, and his um, younger siblings came, and they danced, and this was a joyous event that really gave his mom a lot of closure. Um, on the bottom right picture, what you see is that outdoor terrace that I talked to you about earlier. And what we have used this terrace for, uh, for us, you know, you guys are at Stanford, so you understand like with California, sunshine therapy, being outdoors is really important. Some of these patients have not been outside for many weeks and months and be able to give them sunshine therapy for the final time is really important. And this area was actually also really um, instrumental during the pandemic because this is the area where uh, we were allowed to have additional visitors and had uh, able to get exceptions for our three wishes patients. The bottom is a um, 
really wonderful display. This is a gentleman who was an artist and told the nurses that, you know, it's, he's kind of bummed that he never had an exhibition for his work. Um, he was on hospice on the oncology ward and she, they encouraged him to um, have his family bring in his artwork and they put it up and they made a brochure to have a little um, exhibition for him and they had um, uh, invitations for the staff to come look as well as his family members. Food and beverages, you know, this is uh, certainly a common category. Uh, the, if a woman who had end-stage heart disease and was no longer a uh, heart transplant candidate, and she was really tired of being stuck on multiple pressures in the ICU, she had been shocked and coded a couple of times already, and she had decided this is not how she wanted to live the remainder of her, her life. Um, she wanted to be disconnected uh, from the CRT, from the vasopressors, and she asked for a glass of champagne uh, prior to the happening, um, and the nurses ran out and got a bottle of Prosecco. This is a my patient who wanted ice cream, um, and I just ran to Ralph's and got some. This is a patient on the top is actually me cooking congee. So this is a rice porridge as common in Asian culture that uh, one of my patients requested, and I was actually very surprised that I wasn't able to find it in LA. And so I cooked it that night and brought it in. And I can tell you the family was so appreciative of me doing that. And they even wanted to videotape the, um, the patient taking that one last bite. Music. So, you know, obviously these are very elaborate pictures of music. Um, but I can tell you more often than not, music is just playing the patient's favorite songs at the bedside. This can come from their own personal iPhone or you know, the, co the computer on wheels in the um, room. Um, these are sort of more elaborate examples. <clears throat> we have the luxury of being in LA and I have been able to hire mariachi bands to get live performers at the bedside. Um, and so most of these are volunteers. And actually I would say all these are volunteers except the mariachi band. And um, this is so simple to do and so easy to do and yet create really changes the environment. On special occasions, um, the reality is that, you know, people were on what they're going on with their lives a lot of times when things bad, bad things happens to their health. So this is, um, we've done a, a handful, I mean, it's probably more than a handful of weddings now. And uh, these are people who are previously engaged, who are going to get married. Um, and or there are parents and the, their children get engaged and they had really hoped to be part of the wedding or the children had really wanted them to be part of the wedding. And we were able to make these weddings happen. And I want to, you know, also emphasize the, how incredible it has been for me to work with the nurses who really put their heart and soul in this, this lower right corner. What you see is a hupa that was created for a Jewish wedding. And what that is, is actually four IV folds covered with a lot of sheets. Um, on the upper left corner, what you see is um, a request uh, by a gentleman who was no longer a lung transplant candidate. And when we proposed the program to him and asked if he needed anything, he said that, you know, he would really like a final date night with his wife. So... The nurses really scurried around, but like they were able to, you know, decorate, um, decorate a plain table and get uh, some nice food and put some thick candles and flowers out. The nurses even logged into their um, Netflix account and allowed the family to watch their final movie today together. Um, this was a very similar story with this couple. And uh, he, we found out that he had can lung cancer such that we couldn't transplant him for his idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. And we wanted to make sure he had a very special Valentine's Day with his wife at the end of life. Um, he was on 100% high flow, but we were able to get his favorite food and decorate his wife, decorate his room and allowed his wife to have a really nice evening with him. On this upper right corner, what you see is a child's birthday party. And this was, um, uh, the son of my patient and what he had expressed to his nurses and us was that he uh, was really hoping that his mom will be part of his nine-year-old birthday celebration. 
So with his parents' permission, we were able to throw a little birthday party in his um, in her in her room, and he the family really really appreciated. Um, the father actually called us back um, a few days after her death to tell to tell us that his children all want to go into healthcare now because of this experience. So how have we evaluated this program at UCLA? You know, we've done a lot of things. We've quantified and classified uh, the wishes. We have determined how much this costs. We've characterized who these patients are. And we've done a lot of interviews with family members, nurses, physicians, and leadership. And lastly, most recently, we sent out surveys to um, families of deceased patients to <clears throat> assess the quality of end of life care. So this is an example of a family interview, just to give you some context. This was a patient who was um, from Las Vegas. And so they were really far from uh, home. And this is her granddaughter speaking. And they had, um, I had uh, initiated the word cloud with them. And her grandmother was actually still very lucid. And she um, was able to listen to what people said about her. So basically her granddaughter, put the um, request out on social media on Facebook and Instagram and say, you know, tell me all these stories about my grandma that, you know, what are the words that you think of? And as she read out the words to her grandma, they were able to laugh and cry. And she like learned about a lot of things about her grandmother that she never otherwise would have. And this is her commentary. It, it made a world of difference. Like to be able to sit there and talk to each other and, it just sparked conversations that we wouldn't have had and we weren't sitting there thinking about like ultimately what's going to happen yeah and laugh and even cry about good things because it's, it's a hard situation especially being so far away from home right. and so far away from family but like the nurses became family yeah like everybody was just so friendly and to be able to do, like, hang up pictures, and it feels like you're not in a hospital anymore. Somebody brought in um, essential oils, a diffuser, right. and music, and just little things that you don't really think about, but they add up and they all matter. It, you don't feel like a patient. You feel like an actual person. Loss is hard, but I, I don't think I would have wanted it any other way because you guys fulfilled every single wish. Um, so as you can see, it's a very meaningful experience for family, but what I also want to emphasize and what I've learned over the years is that this program is equally important to healthcare workers, um, that I think that it means so much to us to be able to provide this type of care and to create something that is positive and memorable at the end of life. And this was a paper that we published um, in the Journal of Palliative Care talking about clinician experiences with the Three Wishes Project. Um, and what, what we also included in that study was uh, surveys. And what you see is that the vast majority, which would be the green and the purple, agree that this invention has created a more enjoyable atmosphere at work. These are some quotes from uh, our focus groups. And this is what some nurses had uh, mentioned about our program. You know, it just brings so much nursing spirit back. Like, hey, this is why we do what we do. And once they're admitted to the ICU, we kind of take their identity away from them. They're just a medical record number. This program gives them their identity back. I think this is one of the few things that brings light to what we're doing. And then this is a recording up with a uh, focus group that I did with the nurses that I'd like to share with you. And to give you some context here was this was a male nurse who uh, encountered a uh, patient and family who really wanted to give her a spa day in the ICU. I think it um, promotes teamwork. I remember I had a, a patient in room 53 with uh, advanced gynecological cancer. It was in the middle of the night and uh, one of the, her wishes was to get her hair and nails done. <laughs> so uh, Your we profession, had right? <laughs> Obviously. <laughs> but you know, I will say that at the time I was dating a hairdresser. So I'm texting like, how do you do an ombre? How do you do a balayage? I'm just like, I don't know what kind of equipment you have, but let's, let's try to do this. But so I had 
our care partner, I had like two other nurses. I had the nursing volunteer in there helping me out. So one was doing the nails, uh, one actually cut her hair. We had, like I had all the supplies in the supply room. So I got the scissors, the shampoo. We washed her hair. We, it was like the ICU salon. <laughs> and you want to know what I use as the blow dryer? What? A bear hugger. <laughs> oh, that's genius! That oh is God. a bear hugger. Excellent. And after that, I was like, we were all, we were laughing. We were like, we were so happy. Yeah, so I think I just want to share with you that that is a story that I think it brings us together as well. And I want to share with you this figure that this is from a paper that how um, three wishes exemplifies organizational compassion. And sometimes when I give these presentations on this program, you know, doctors and nurses, especially nurses, actually tell me, you know, Dr. Neville, we already do this for our patients. We always do nice things. If they really want to get married or it's their birthday, of course, you know, we would go out of our way to like gather money from each other and like try to make it possible. And I think what's really unique and important about this program is that it, it makes it official and nobody is alone in individual you know, trying to achieve these things that the, what I call is that the three wishes are actually, um, I'm sorry, that an institutional capacity to provide high quality and applied care is called up by these pillars of organized compassion that's really facilitated by something that's labeled as the Three Wishes Project, something that's official is end of life care. So collective noticing, for instance, you know, the Three Wishes recognizes the pain and suffering of patients and families. It acknowledges clinician distress, bearing witness to the suffering of others. Collective healing, it enables clinicians and families to exist in the same emotional space, and it fosters clinicians sharing meaningful experiences with each other. And then most importantly, collective responding, right? It really empowers clinician teamwork to provide compassionate care to patients and families. It encourages clinicians to support peer colleagues while they comfort patients and families. It doesn't make it an anomaly, but something that we work together and this becomes an institutional mission as uh, healthcare workers. This is what uh, we call an at a glance sheet. So these are actually uh, created at the end of every month and it's to summarize uh, the progress of the initiative. So our program has existed since December of 2017. And since then we have had over 1400 patients and we have fulfilled nearly 5,000 wishes. You know, we call that three wishes program, but this is something that the number of wishes really depends on what the patient and family needs. We have fulfilled one wish, we have fulfilled 12 wishes. Uh, what I think is really remarkable is on average, it's still about $30 per patient. And of course, this doesn't count um, healthcare worker time, but in terms of direct costs, the items that, um, that we give out, the cost is pretty minimal. And one of the things that I'm actually particularly proud of is that this is an initiative that has uh, participation for from nearly 500 nurses, 70 physicians. I think that that is an amazing um, testament to how widespread this program has become in our institution. Um, and I wanna also fully acknowledge that our program didn't start out that way. We had, um, this is was an initiative that started solely in the medical ICU where I worked in. On the left side, what you see is the number of patients per month. Um, as you can see in the beginning of our project, it was all blue and very low. And um, it is, um, I'm very pleased to say, you know, with time, our program has grown and expanded to all the different ICUs in our hospitals, which I am sure your, your hospital also has uh, plenty of different ICUs as well. And, the, and it has become very multicolored. And I can tell you the very peak of this is during one of our COVID surges. And to be very honest with you, when the COVID pandemic hit, I thought this was going to be impossible to initiate. And what I very quickly learned was that it became even more necessary. That being said, we had to make a lot of adaptations during the COVID pandemic, the peak of it at least. Um, you know, with patients and uh, families no longer able to be allowed at the uh, bedside, we had to adapt. And I also wanted to make sure that we weren't giving the patients and families any infectious things. So, you know, the fingerprint keychains that we were giving out to almost every single family, I needed to make sure that 
they were not infectious. So we actually used the same mechanism that we used to um, sterilize our N95 masks when we had to reuse them to sterilize the fingerprints. Um, and we put them in this UV radiation machine and was able to create these and send them to families. I mentioned this other earlier, um, these EKG keepsakes could be created whether the patient or family was there. Um, we went virtual for a lot of things. Uh, on the right side, what you see is an altar. And I want to say, like, this was a particularly sad story in that, you know, I got an email from a patient and basically she told me that a few weeks ago, her mom had died in our ICU and we, and she got really, she got these keepsakes and they were really meaningful to family. And unfortunately her father was now dying in our ICU a few weeks later. And she wanted to know if we, we can create the same for him. I can tell you this is the only, and I hope uh, will always be the only EKG, double EKG keepsake that we created. Um, and now this, this lives in an altar in her home. Um, this was a, uh, we brought the mariachi band in for during the, the, the pandemic. This is where I really emphasize that, you know, I was able to call up infection control. And so this is the three wishes patient. Can we make an exception? And this was an outdoor mask. Um, socially distanced event, but I think as you see, the expression on his face was pretty priceless. Um, during the pandemic, volunteers were no longer allowed to be in the hospital, so that uh, uh, they really, they reached out to me actually and said, you know, Dr. Neville, how can we contribute to this program? Uh, one of which was a volunteer who did arts and crafts with the kids um, in the pediatric wards, and she would do painting and drawings with them. Uh, so she and I actually came up with this, like maybe we can make these commemorative paintings uh, that integrate the patient's uh, fingerprints. And what these are is exactly that. So we, uh, healthcare workers would, ob would obtain fingerprints on blank pieces of paper and uh, we gave them to the artist. And what the artist would then do is incorporate these fingerprints into a painting that was meaningful to the family. So we have them, do we have any requests? So what you see here is um, painting with turtles, but when you look closer, those turtles actually have fingerprints on them and those belong to the patient. And we have made multiple ones of these and personalized in every single way and form. Um, this was an initiative that I actually really thought was only going to last during the pandemic with the volunteers and with um, the need at the time. But I can tell you, we have made hundreds of these now. And I think this is an initiative that we will continue to do. Um, this is something that I think has been really appreciated by a lot of families. Oh, there's a lot. This last one I think is pretty amazing. This was a very specific request and it was a request of uh, grandpa who was the patient that died holding hands with his four grandchildren <clears throat> at Lake Tahoe. Uh, this is just a demonstrate, you know, we certainly had to adapt. We had to make, uh, uh, changes to our program during the pandemic. And, and uh, the way that we were able to sustain it was really to have bedside innovations in terms of expanding keepsake offerings, mailing keepsakes post-mortem, and the programmatic adaptations. We moved everything to Zoom and still continue to have our meetings. And we still had institutional support. You know, I think I'm very blessed at UCLA in that our institution actually provides a full-time project manager and we were able to use the hospital volunteers for the paintings um, and continue to do it that way. Um, this was our very uh, recent study. And what we showed here is that this was kind of our first quantitative study. We've done a lot of qualitative work, but this was the first time that we use a validated quantitative study to really go, examine whether the Three Wishes Project has uh, an effect on families' perspective of end-of-life care. And what we did was we mailed these surveys out to families about three months of after um, the patient's death, all the deaths that occurred in the ICU, and we compared the patients who received Three Wishes versus those who did not. And what we really saw was that um, 
that the emotional and spiritual support factor uh, aspect on the on the survey was significantly higher for patients uh, who had free wishes as part of the end of life care. Um, and I always like to say, you know, I always think of this project and initiative as a lovely lovely project, but it's also a project that has generated a lot of academic findings and uh, papers that we have published along the way. Uh, I'm particularly uh, impressed with this one recently because this was a review in the intensive care of medicine and it cited four papers that uh, demonstrated that family-centered care and life in the intensive care unit was really important and we were one of those studies. Um, I want to end uh, with this story and this is a story of my patient um, who was only 50 years old and she had a horrible devastating infection. She basically had mucor um, and her nasal sinuses that invaded into her brain uh, that really wasn't survivable. And I got to know the family pretty well and learned that, you know, she's a woman who loved the outdoors, who loved gardening, um, who was really full of life. And I wanted to honor her as much as possible. Um, and what we did for her uh, was uh, brought her outside for sunshine therapy since that was something that was very important to her. Um, and we also hired a, um, most recently actually, we hired a music therapist to work with our three wishes patients. And what this meant was that if the family agreed and wanted to, uh, our music therapist would come to the bedside, would you know bring a guitar and sing songs with the family. Um, and if they wanted, create a song, write a song together with the family, um, such as they can remember the patient by. And uh, this uh, patient really loved Fleetwood Mac, um, and they sang landslide at the bedside. And uh, more importantly, they uh, they wrote lyrics together to a song, a short song. And I'll play it for you. And what's even extra special about this is that the patient's heartbeat recording uh, served as the drums in the background. Oops, sorry. Gave us love and you gave us life. A wild woman with sparkling eyes. Lover of the sun and of the snow. Tending to her garden and watching it. I think you can agree with me. That was a really beautiful legacy to have. And this was placed in a teddy bear and sent to the family. Um, I want to say, you know, this is an initiative that I really hope that will be expanded to multiple institutions, hopefully like yourself. Um, this is a website that we created just for that. We had a lot of our um, tips and our success stories and as well as templates and stuff that we have all put online to help other institutions kind of do the same initiative. Um, and this is actually, this is the end of my slides. Um, and what I want to really hope is that uh, this initiative really um, brings home the concept that death is not always a failure in the ICU. It's also an opportunity to reduce suffering, to honor a patient's wishes and autonomy, to celebrate the life of the patient and create peaceful memories during final moments. Um, I really think that it's appropriate at these times to change the question from what is the matter with the patient to really what matters to the patient. 
have this is an initiative that I did not do by myself. Obviously, it takes the whole village, as you can see. Um, and and I just also want to say, you know, this is a website. We are on social media. If that's something that you're interested in, and I would be happy to take questions at this time. Dr. Neville, thank you so much. Um, I'm I'm getting messages from many folks who uh, uh, who are are so touched um, um, by the stories, but also just the the tremendous impact of um, care, um, the care that you and the program and all the teams um, uh, are are participating in. Um, uh, and and I loved your last slide as a palliative care physician that. Death is part of kind of caring for people um, and caring for people in the ICU. Um, so I uh, we do have an, uh, several different questions. Um, I'm going to go to Dr. Rogers first, who is one of our pulmonary and critical care physicians here, and uh, coincidentally, um, for the first question. Thank you so much for a wonderful Grand Rounds. It, it, I agree, it's really moving. I'll just share that when I was training 20 years ago, we had ICU rounds uh, that were you know, guarded from families. Families could come in from noon to eight, and then it expanded to families can be there anytime. And in fact, families should be there on rounds. And it was one of those things where it's like, it's such a no brainer <laughs> that to yeah. have a family be there makes sense and leads to better care for all your patients, right? And I feel like that's similar with this kind of an approach to end of life that you don't really need a p-value in some ways, though good to have. It's so obvious that it's what we would all want, right, at the right. time of our our death or the death of a loved one. Um, and so I uh, kudos to you and your team oh, for you. offering this to so many people, particularly during um, during COVID, where I would say a lot of us in ICU felt like the separation from families was uh, one of the worst parts of the whole thing for their um, dying loved ones. Uh, my question, my question for you is I noticed, you know, in, in your um, case control about that it helps people that you had a lot of patients, even with all the resources that you've built, who died without the three wishes. And I would say for us, you know, it's, we do many, we've had a mariachi, you know, a lot of these that we've had marriages. How do, what tips do you have about how to spread it, how to not miss patients, um, you know, in as you're growing this to be something that's offered to everyone, what what hurdles keep you from getting to all the patients? That's a really excellent question. And the question that I have to answer, especially in the world of equity and like diversity, all this stuff that we don't want to exclude patients. I think that this um, this grow this project initiative really grew out very organically from healthcare workers, like you know, filling the patients that need it. So fortunately and unfortunately, you know, this some patients are just going to be missed. And, and what happens for, for us, I think a lot of the patients are patients who come in and die very rapidly, you know, so there's no sense, um, there's no really no time to get to know the patient, know the family. Uh, certainly we have given patients, families like this keepsakes and such, but sometimes it's just so overwhelming for families to deal with that it doesn't feel appropriate to bring up. Uh, so I think that happens a lot. And I have to say, fully admit the other thing that I think that I, um, as a program director, can approve upon is night shift deaths. You know, so the night shift doesn't just doesn't hear about it as much as they are not as well trained and the champions aren't there at night. And that is something that I am working on to establish like nighttime champions too, so that everybody knows about it. And the third is um, there are families who decline, you know, so I think that is also how you frame the initiative. I can tell you that like a lot of times, I don't like bring up the word three wishes. I don't bring up the NL5 program, but it's like, can I bring you, can I bring you guys, you know, a soft non-hospital blanket? Most people would not say no to that and would not find that threatening. But I think that there are some patients, people who bring it, don't bring it up that way and it gets declined. And, and not all declines are bad. I also fully say, you know, this isn't for everybody. And if you are not, you know, don't want any of this stuff, that is more than okay. And we actually had a gentleman who spoke to us and said, you know, the reason that I want to choose disconnecting from the machines and proceed with dying is that my life is complete and I don't need any wishes. <laughs> so that was a very remarkable answer. But I think that more often than not, it's what I had mentioned to you earlier, and some of which we are working on, and some of which I think is organic and is never going to change, unfortunately. 
Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to turn to actually Dr. Weinecker, um, who is one of our um, senior vice chairs in the Department um, for Clinical Affairs and also a pulmonary and critical care physician as well. Um, Dr. Weinecker. Great. Thanks, Stephanie. Um, and, and thank you, Tom. This was really wonderful. I um, am the medical director of our six ICUs and um, would love, uh, first off, I love how you personalize the patients because that's such a challenge uh, when patients are as depersonalized as they are and you showed in one of your early photos. Um, we, as, uh, as Angela said, we've done a number of these things as well, but it's certainly not part of our standard work. It's not, it's not a oh, we just will do this, what we always do, because we don't always do this. Um, so uh, my questions uh, are, are similar, uh, I think, to, uh, to Angela, to Dr. Rogers, but um, my questions are, number one, how, how did you make this part of standard work as much as you have? Um, how long did it take? And then in terms of cost, um, how do you fund this? Because I just think this is so incredibly valuable, and I'm I'm in awe of how creative you guys have been um, with some of the some of the things that you've done for for patients. Yeah, uh, those are excellent excellent questions. So all stuff that I had to deal with, like in terms of starting this program. Um, so the first question regarding like how do I make it ingrained into like what the nurses do as part of their workflow is that I got buy in from the each unit nursing director. You know, so in the very beginning, I always encourage places to start small, start with the unit that you are most familiar with and they, you would lead it and people would trust you and have, and choose champions who have similar uh, enough life uh, interests and passion. So the first thing I did was to you know, talk to the nursing director in my unit and establish champions there. And, you know, we have, and the medical ICU has mortality about like 20%. And so the social initiative that a lot of nurses wanted to embrace. And so we started small um, and we continued there that, you know, there was just a few champions who were uh, uh, used to the program. We actually created a pager number for the Three Wishes team, which was mostly me <laughs> and a couple of other nurses who would help achieve the wishes when they came about. And I can tell you that pager we have got long gotten rid of because now it's becoming great such that everybody can achieve it in the nursing center. doesn't really need the pager anymore. Um, but I think what helped spread it and become ingrained and accepted really was that um, I started, or I should say, I stopped being shy about giving presentations. And giving presentations like this actually really brought the word out. And I was shocked to be very honest with you. Like I gave this talk to the ethics center um, because I was part of the ethics uh, committee, but they asked me to give a talk on this. And I was shocked because after the talk, um, well, actually I should say this, like during the talk, somebody asked me, you know, how do you have the resources to continue this and what is gonna go on the program? I said, I, you know, I have a $10,000 grant as a seed project. Uh, it's gonna probably run out by the end of six months. And I was almost in tears. And the next day I got a, um, a telephone call and saying, you know, I don't know who you talked to during the ethics committee, but somebody in the audience wants to donate $10,000 to you to continue the program. And so our program is almost 100% philanthropically um, uh, supported. I am also very pleased that, you know, when I did the research that uh, talked about uh, leadership and buy-in from administration, I interviewed the CMO and the CEO and the uh, chief of the whole staff and uh, talk to them about the program and they have really supported it such that we have a hired full-time project manager to help with this. So that's a very uh, unique institutional support, I would say. And donations have actually been really big to the program. So, you know, the late, the patient that I told you that with her husband who died in her arms outside, um, that was our first three wishes patient. So that's more than five years ago. Just a few months ago, I got an email saying, you know, you got a donation for an amount of $25,000. And I was like, what? Where did this come from? And it was a name that I did not recognize. And what I learned was that um, she, uh, in this five-year time, had remarried. And that donation was from her and her husband. So I think that speaks volumes to how much this program means to people. And that's why um, it continues to be alive, honestly. Yeah. 
Thank you. Thank you very much. And also thank you for publishing on this because it does, I mean, it's very important in an academic center to publish what we're doing. And it also spreads it so that other people know about it outside of the people that you can reach by doing talks like this. So thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Neville. I know we're close to the hour. There was a, an additional question that had um, come up around spillover effects and curious around how this has either impacted your institution, but also kind of outside of the institution. A lot of this is available on your website um, in terms of the toolkit or just kind of how the, the program is set up. So Dr. Harmon, and, and maybe Dr. Woods too, like I, I didn't quite understand this question actually. What do you, what, what do you mean spillover effects? I think that, well, my impression uh, just uh, with regards to the spillover, meaning like are other institutions regionally doing this? Oh, how does it, how it, is it done. spreading? Yeah, yes. and cultural, yeah. it might be cultural within your institution, but yeah. also beyond that, right? In yeah. terms of measuring Absolutely. that. Absolutely, yeah. So, you know, over time, because it, it is, you know, I'm active on social media, as you know, so like, I think a lot of people have reached me out to me for this way. And I have given talks so much to this. And, and and it is that reason why that we have created the toolkit. And then, um, as you know, this program started in Canada, and I can tell you that um, they just tallied their uh, numbers, and it looks like there's about uh, twenty something to thirty programs around the world. And I say world because I think which is I'm really happy about because uh, it has started the UK as well. Um, and there is about uh, 20, I think, in the United States. That's wonderful. Thank you. Um, I know we are right after the hour, but if you could stay for one more minute, there was one other person um, I wanted to turn over to Dr. Salas for one last question, which I think is just, uh, really important. Um, go ahead, Dr. Salas. Thank you so much for, for sharing all of this. Um, my question is just sitting here with you for 40 minutes, I was like bawling. So how do you care for yourself in doing this work? I see, you know, the slides you presented earlier about how much meaning there is in it. I totally get that, but it's also so emotional. So I just yeah. wondered what, how you, what you do to sustain yourself in this very difficult and important work. Yeah, people ask me that a lot, actually, and I think my answer is pretty counterintuitive, and it's actually through this kind of work that I find meaning in Dallas, you know, um, being able to connect with family members after the death still and contact me because of what had happened in the ICU, I think it's incredibly, incredibly rewarding. Um, I think that um, uh, I continue to feel very emotional as <laughs> to attending myself and, you know, and, and I've learned over time that that, that that is not a weakness and something that I like, I don't think I want to lose um, as I go on working as an ICU attending. Um, so unfortunately, unfortunately, my answer is to you is like, I don't have a secret, <laughs> a great solution or answer to that question. But I think that three wishes actually helps uh, rather than the reverse to see something that is positive, you know, in the darkest moment. Um, and I think that actually, I'm going to be cheesy, but quote Nana Gorman, that, um, if, 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 what does she say? She said, you know, there's always light. If you're brave enough to see it, if you're brave enough to be it. And I think this program really exemplifies that. Wow. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Neville. That is a, actually a wonderful way to, to close this. Um, and to uh, to just envision and and how you embody that light um, and your program does um, uh, in the intensive care unit. Um, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so um, much for having me. Of course, yes. And um, uh, just a reminder for next week's Grand Rounds as well um, for Dr. Hotez. Thank you all. The preceding program is copyrighted by the Board of Trustees of the Leland Stanford Junior University please visit us at med.stanford.edu.